let's look at how to replace the real numbers with a finite set capital F for computing. First, let's just take a brief look at how not to do it. So the sort of the most tempting thing to do is to take our number line and let's just start at zero and go out to infinity. And then we'll just equally space values along this number line. So for example, if the spacing was a quarter, then here's the number one. And the next number in this set past one would be 1.25. Where we run into problems is if you go way out, and let's say we look at a million, and then the number after a million is a million point two five. Well, one point two five only has three significant digits in it, whereas a million point two five has nine significant digits, and that means we would be representing large numbers much more accurately than smaller numbers, which is usually not something that we want we're going to use what are called floating point numbers. It's what's used almost all the time in scientific numerical computing. So in floating point, let's look at that number line again. And we'll only go from zero to infinity. If we want negative numbers, we'll just take the negative of the ones that we put down here. Zero and infinity are going to be in our set. So infinity is a special number called inf. Now let's look at the interval just from one to two. Inside this interval, we'll use the same strategy as we started before. So I'll just put in an equally spaced number of values between one and two, not including the right endpoint. On computers, we like binary numbers. So we'll say that there are an even power of two, two to the D values, in this interval from one to two. Here's where the magic happens. Let's just multiply all those values by two. They will now end up in the interval from two to four. They're still equally spaced, but they have twice as wide a spacing as the original group. So we have another two to the D values between two and four. And then I go back to the original group and I multiply them by 1 half, or 2 to the minus 1 power. So again, I'll get 2 to the d values. Now they'll fill up the interval from 1 half to 1. And you see how we can just keep doing this as long as we like, uh, making them both smaller and larger, and filling up the positive number line. In practice, we have to stop after finitely many powers of 2, um, but that hardly ever turns out to be an issue. So to summarize the situation, in each interval between a power of two and the next one, we have two to the d equally spaced values. However, the spaces between the numbers are different in different intervals. The idea is that the size of the gaps is bounded relative to the size of the number being represented. Here's another look at the math. So let's say x is a value in one of these intervals, of course, Every value is in one of those intervals. And we'll use FL of x to represent the, the floating point value that is closest to x. So then the difference between the floating point representation of x and x itself, well, that's bounded by half the size of one of these gaps, right? So we write 1 half times the width of the gap. The width of the gap is the length of the interval over the number of points in the interval. So now if we make this a relative gap, so the size of the gap relative to x itself, then in fact we can remove the 2 to the e factor because we know that x is at least that large, so 1 over x is at least that small. And so we find the relative error in the representation is bounded by a half times this number, 2 to the minus d, and this is an important value that we call machine epsilon. It's also sometimes called unit round off or machine round off. Typically one's using what's called IEEE 754 standard double precision representation. And in that representation, 
is equal to 52. So that means that machine epsilon is 2 to the negative 52, which is roughly 10 to the minus 16th. So that's a relative accuracy of 10 to the minus 16, which is around 16 significant digits. Here's an alternative way to look at floating point values. If we think in terms of binary, then we can write a binary expansion for the floating point number. So that's 1 plus, well, some multiple of 2 to the minus d, which is the spacing in one of these intervals, and then the whole thing gets multiplied by a factor 2 to the e for scaling. So this 1 plus k times 2 to the minus d, that's just our original set of 2 to the d numbers in the interval 1 to 2, with everything being scaled by 2 to the e. If we think in binary, we can look at these values between 1 and 2 as a binary expansion. So we have 52 binary digits. Each of those represents a different negative power of 2. So 1 half, 1 quarter, 1 eighth, and so on. So if we think in binary, we have 52 binary significant digits. Actually, it should be 53 because of that leading 1. And again, that's roughly equivalent to 16 decimal significant digits. When you get down to it, floating point representation is just scientific notation for numbers expressed in binary form. We have this important value, machine epsilon. That's the relative precision of floating point representation. Another way of defining it is as the distance between 1 and the first floating point number larger than 1. One thing machine epsilon is not, and this is a common mistake, is that it's not the smallest positive value we can represent. That's actually a much smaller number, around 10 to the minus 308. It's just the smallest value we can represent relative to 1. There is another important aspect to machine epsilon, though. It also tells us the relative accuracy of floating point arithmetic. We won't get deep into the details, but the idea is that if you have two floating point values, and you have a machine analog of addition, so we'll say circle plus, then the relative difference between the machine addition and the true sum is again bounded by machine epsilon. And the same will be true for subtraction, multiplication, division, all the other standard operations. That seems like a pretty reasonable thing. We only ever make small errors in our relative sense. And yet, as at least one consequence, is that we actually break some fundamental laws that we're used to. For example, again, machine epsilon is the distance from 1 to the next floating point number greater than 1. So that means that the floating point value of 1 plus 1 half machine epsilon is just 1. There's nothing else there. So as a result, on the machine, the difference between 1 plus this small change minus 1 is actually 0. That's a little bit weird, but it gets weirder. Let's look at 1 half machine epsilon minus 1. So that's the negative of 1 minus a half machine epsilon. So in the forward direction, the next number is epsilon machine away. But in the backwards direction, it's only half that far away. And so that is a floating point number. 1 minus 1 half epsilon m is in the floating point set. So if you take that number and you add 1, which is also a floating point value, then we get a non-zero result. In fact, we get exactly the right answer this time. And the only difference between these two examples is the order of operations. So in other words, we've broken the associative law of addition.
We like the associative law, and so that's kind of a big loss. But as we'll see, it's not that hard to contain the damage. 